accused of ethnic cleansing against minority Muslims in Myanmar. Human Rights Watch says government security forces did nothing to stop the violence and even took part in it. The report comes as the European Union lifts sanctions against the country and the president is given a top peace award. This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Rida Fakhri. Authorities in Myanmar stand accused of a campaign of ethnic cleansing of Rohingya Muslims. A report by Human Rights Watch says their actions amount to crimes against humanity, including murder, persecution and deportation. It relates to violence in Myanmar's western Rakhine state in June and October of last year, in which more than 200 people were killed and over 100,000 were forcibly displaced. The report found extensive state involvement in planning in the killings and destruction of property. It said community leaders and Buddhist monks also played a role in the killings along with police and army personnel. The report also criticized the government of President Thein Sein for failing to bring those responsible to justice. Myanmar's government has denied the charges made in the report and plans to publish its own findings. Veronica Pedrosa has more. Ethnic cleansing. Crimes against humanity legal terms for horrific crimes that Human Rights Watch says were committed in Myanmar last year. You know, the government has consistently characterized what's been going on as purely communal violence. Um, we've in fact documented extensive evidence uh, indicating a high level of, um, uh, of involvement in, from the state in these abuses. In the first wave of violence in June, Buddhist Rakhines, also known as Arakanese, and Muslim Rohingya mobs clashed. Both communities were swept up in a storm of killings and arson. Both communities suffered. But since then, the violence turned sharply anti-Muslim. HRW has found that at first, state security forces did nothing to prevent the violence. But then they joined with Rakhine mobs to attack and burn Muslim neighborhoods and villages. This image, provided by HRW, shows ethnic Rakhines with weapons walking away from a village in flames while a soldier stands by. On June the 13th, HRW reports eyewitnesses said they watched as a government truck dumped 18 naked and half-clothed bodies of Rohingya in a pile. Al Jazeera has seen photographs of the dumped bodies, too graphic for broadcast, that corroborate the witnesses' descriptions that some bodies still had their hands bound and appear to have been killed execution style. At least one was a child. They were buried in two pits marked by makeshift bamboo fences. But when HRW asked Myanmar President Thein Sein in a letter what authorities had done with the bodies of the killed, his office replied in a fax that, quote, the dead bodies of Bengalis were buried in their religious cemeteries with the arrangement of Rakhine state government, unquote. The report also documents new evidence about the humanitarian crisis unfolding in Rakhine state right now. Tens of thousands of people need food, medical care and shelter, but the government's doing very little to change the situation. Veronica Pedroza, Al Jazeera. We'll go to our guest in just a moment. First, though, on the line from Yangon in Myanmar is Win Tin, a founding member of the National League for Democracy, along with Aung San Suu Kyi. He's also a former political prisoner. Mr. Win Tin, Human Rights Watch has said it is baffled by the fact that your party, the NLD, its leader, Aung San Suu Kyi, have remained quiet about the atrocities that have been committed against the Rohingya people. Why haven't you been denouncing these crimes more forcefully? She is silent because she cannot uh, speak out, you see, everything. Because really, you see, uh, we, we are not the government. Uh, she is just a, uh, just a political uh, party's leader, you see. So she cannot uh, speak what she, she doesn't know, all the things, you see, what happened uh, there and, and what is the causes and what, was, uh, what is happening and so on. 
But Mr. Wintin, yes. what is happening is very well documented. Even though the burden of action does fall on the government, shouldn't Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, the most prominent opposition member in Myanmar, be using her moral authority to denounce what is going on? Uh, it is not very easy for me uh, to comment about the reason why she is silent and so on. Uh, the only thing I can tell you is that, you see, she has to keep quiet uh, on some, some of the things, but she doesn't know all the things, what happened and, and so on. But, but is it really because she doesn't know what is going on or because she has her eye on the election in 2015? Oh, no, 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 I don't think so. Because people, you see, on San are uh, only a small part, small part of the country. So it doesn't matter for her election. I think she is quite free if she wants to express what she thinks. Mr. Winton, it was really good talking to you. Thank you. Let's go straight to our guest now in Kuala Lumpur, Mwang Zani, a visiting fellow at the London School of Economics and founding member of the Free Burma Coalition. In Singapore, Alistair Cook, a visiting research fellow at the East Asian Institute of the National University of Singapore. And in London, Mike Harris from the Index on Censorship, an international organization that promotes and defends the right to freedom of expression. And Wang Zani, the government rejects the findings of this Human Rights Watch report. Is there any reason to question the credibility of this report that accuses the government of a campaign of ethnic cleansing against the Rohingya people? No, uh, you know, the Human Rights Watch is not simply um, it, you know, uh, the premier human rights research organization in the world. Uh, this is by far the very best and most solidly researched um, report I have ever seen in the past 10 years as a, you know, a, a professional researcher, um, you know, uh, with the, um, uh, in higher education. So there is absolutely no basis uh, for the Burmese regime to reject this. Uh, or dismisses a report as non-credible. As a matter of fact, the report that the Burmese regime said uh, it's going to bring out, actually, in uh, I think tomorrow, 23rd um, uh, April, is the, the least credible and, uh, you know, the, uh, the most dubious uh, piece of document they're going to um, bring out. And uh, we will get into that in the, during the course of discussion, because I know the people that were involved in the process of uh, investigating the uh, rights abuses uh, from the government side. You say it's a solidly researched piece of work, obviously not what the government in Myanmar thinks. Alistair Cook, the Myanmar government has accused Human Rights Watch of timing its report to coincide with the EU decision to lift sanctions. Does that undermine the report's credibility, its objectivity? Uh, no, not at all. I think what we've seen uh, with this report is it's very well documented, as Zani had said. And in fact, if the government spokesman is saying that it's based on biased media um, analysis, if you just turn to the methodology of the report, you will quickly find that it's interviewed you know, uh, dozens of people on the ground in five of the most affected areas in Rakhine State. So I think it's disingenuous to say that. Um, but what certainly there are public relations with all these sorts of reports and timing um, to get the most impact is obviously key as well. So um, certainly you can't discount that it's come out at the same time. Um, but this has been documented over a very long period of time, um, which is outlined in the report. What does it tell us, though, about the EU's motivations and calculations, Mike Harris? Is the EU effectively ignoring its own set of benchmarks, its own set of conditions that were once attached with the lifting of these sanctions? They called for, quote, at one point, an end to all internal conflicts, freedom for all political prisoners, unfettered humanitarian access to the country, and, crucially here, an end to the persecution of a Muslim minority. Obviously, that hasn't happened. No, and um, the fear is that the European Union have eased the sanctions, in fact, too early. Um, what I think we'd like to see and what civil society in Burma would like to see is uh, a clear framework um, for um, EU engagement and, in fact, uh, the engagement of the international community with the Burmese government. Um, there are still many restrictive laws and draconian laws in place in Burma. Um, what's uh, with, with when we look at these conflicts, the space for civil society to protest um, for peace is actually curtailed. Um, newspapers deal with the ethnic conflict um, very sensitively. 
Um, it's clear that lots of newspapers hold their tongue while reporting on human rights violations because they fear um, that they may be subject to criminal defamation proceedings by the government or that their licenses um, for publishing daily could be withdrawn. So there's also a free speech element to this in that um, audiences in Yangon or Mandalay actually have uh, a very limited access to information about the conflict and the scale of the conflict. Wang Zani, do you feel that this EU decision is inappropriate, that it is uh, premature? Is it all to do with political expediency, in, in a sense, trying to reap all the economic trade benefits that exist in Myanmar, regardless of what abuses may be going on? Well, the European Union's uh, common position on Burma is uh, anything but about the Burmese uh, freedom or human rights or the well-being of the Burmese people. It has everything to do with the European commercial and strategic interests. And, uh, you know, the, um, uh, uh, the Eurozone has been in crisis and uh, Euro European economies are not doing well. Everybody knows it. And so Burma is seen uh, through the eyes of the European strategic and commercial interests as a strategic location sandwiched between China and India and also as the one of the largest remaining brothels of natural resources you know the benchmarks are not met as a matter of fact you know like uh, within the past one year since the EU set benchmarks for Burma uh, we have seen you know a series of uh, waves of violence uh, that uh, merit or that warrant actually international criminal investigation by the United Nations and also increase uh, in the um, massive military operations against uh, Christian Kachin communities in northern Burma. And so uh, within the past year, things in Burma for minorities, ethnic uh, minorities, uh, religious minorities, as well as Burmese farmers uh, have gotten worse, not better. And yet the European Union has gone ahead to reward the Burmese military uh, uh, quasi-civilian government of Thein Sein with such uh, economic feat. Well, it isn't just the EU heaping praise on Myanmar, as well as winning support from the European Union. President Thein Sein has also been chosen to receive a prestigious Peace Prize. The In Pursuit of Peace Award, as it is known, is from the International Crisis Group. It recognizes individuals for their outstanding contributions to the advancement of peace and security. It praises the president of Myanmar for his efforts to, quote, bring us closer to a world free of conflict. Alistair Cook, President Thein Sein, being honored by the ICG in this top uh, peace award. Is it deserved when you consider that he's been in power for now uh, two years, that the abuses that have been taking place haven't taken place under the previous junta's leadership, but under his own watch, both in June and October of last year. Should he bear direct responsibility for what is going on? Uh, well, I think there are two questions there. The first one is, is he deserving of this award? Well, firstly, it's obviously not for peace that's already been achieved. So it's for um, peace that could be achieved. Um, so I guess that's the first point. And the second point, um, over whether enough's being done to uh, move these processes forward across the country. What we're seeing with the release of this report or even what's happening in, in Kachin State or indeed some of the, the other ethnic nationality areas as well is that there, there is conflict still ongoing. So um, at the moment the, the signs aren't there. But I think the motivation that ICG have for this award is um, positive reinforcement, I think they would frame it as. But has peace been achieved? No, it hasn't. Do you agree with this, Mike Harris? How much of a pinch of salt should this statement by the ICG and indeed the award itself be taken with? Uh, well, I won't criticise the ICG because they do do good work. But what I would say is that there's two things going on here. There's a, uh, a country in which there is serious ethnic conflict. Um, and there's also a country which is in transition. And there's no doubt that um, under the president there have been some reforms which have been positive. Um, it's clear that parliament is having a greater role um, in the internal matters of the country. It's clear that parliament and the opposition as well are in the process of 
considering uh, legal reform to open up the space for civil society and freedom of expression. That said, uh, it's still the case that the military are able to operate um, separate from the president and from parliament um, and are committing serious human rights violations. Um, and it's the interplay between these two things which I think is, is quite complex. Um, Burma could have successful democratic elections in 2015, but you know, as we said with the EU um, uh, and sanctions, I think it is very, very early stages, and all of the you know, and this draconian uh, legal framework is still in place. It's just not being enforced. Plus, you have these human rights violations. So, I think it's a mixed picture. We can see that there is reform, and we can see that political leaders such as um, Aung San Suu Kyi are out of prison, but you have this in the mix of uh, a great deal of internal instability. Wang Zani, a lot of people uh, accused of looking the sure. other way. Human Rights Watch has also expressed its bafflement about why Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, someone of her international stature, uh, political opposition figure within Myanmar hasn't been more forceful in her comments uh, condemning the violence. Is it because she has an eye on the election in 2015 and has significant political calculations in mind as well? Well, I mean, she's been in a difficult situation, uh, uh, no doubt. But at the same time, uh, you know, um, I have watched her very closely, and we share a panel at the um, London School of Economics uh, last year, June. And uh, when the issue of uh, Rohingya ethnic cleansing came up, um, I was the one who was asked to address the, um, uh, the, the question of the ethnocide and the citizenship of the Rohingya people, uh, uh, you know, uh, at the forum. But the, I want to return to the international crisis group, um, uh, you know, role but here. For, but first I think of all, how ICG's important? First of all, how important do you think would it be for someone like Aung San Suu Kyi, a, a pro-democracy icon in many parts of the world? How important is it for her to speak more forcefully about what is going on? Oh, absolutely. It is extremely uh, important for her to speak out. Um, actually, she needed to have, uh, she needs to actually um, you know, call the, um, the, the, uh, what is happening in the country um, basically as neo-fascist racism, because that's what it is. You know, uh, the, uh, you know, the, when I started using the word neo-Nazi uh, neo Buddhist uh, movement, uh, people thought I was exaggerating. Well, that was about almost like eight or nine months ago, and now uh, the, there is a very um, you know, uh, uh, nascent and uh, growing movement in the country that is um, uh, uh, openly actually uh, uh, ignored by the Burmese military uh, government, if not actively supported, and that is targeting uh, Muslim uh, communities across the country, not just the Rohingya. The, I mentioned the I ICG here because ICG is um, explaining a way why the, uh, you know, uh, why ethnic conflict uh, is flaring up and, and is using the language of transition. Actually, the, uh, if you look at the Human Rights Watch reports, um, the language, it categorically stated there is uh, states crucial involvement in the uh, uh, waves of violence against uh, Rohingyas, and now actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, t about two weeks ago, against the uh, Muslims across 15 cities and towns in Burma. And so the ICG is playing a role of um, legitimizer. This is the ethnic conflict, especially religious conflict conflict has nothing to do with Burma opening up and, and liberalizing. It has everything to do with the Burmese state under the uh, management of Thein Sein, uh, manipulating, uh, in quotes, natural ethnic and religious prejudices uh, uh, for political and strategic ends. Alistair Cook, is everyone at the end of the day playing politics here? How surprised, how disappointed will human rights advocates, activists around the world in Myanmar be about Aung San Suu Kyi's conspicuous silence? The fact that she has been very timid in her statements, all she has said to date uh, is something to the effect that uh, it is sad that the situation has come to this and that she has uh, been urging everyone to respect law and order. Surely the atrocities that have been commit committed in the past uh, year or so, the documented evidence we have seen 
about abuses being committed against the Muslim communities in Rohingya would warrant, wouldn't they, a more forceful approach and, and um, a response from someone like her? Right, well, what I would say here is that when we're looking now at what's going on in Myanmar, Burma, is we have to focus on interests, that it's no longer um, some sort of unstable transition where people have, are making these coalitions. There are very many different layers to what's going on there, and there are lots of different actors with very different motivations. Now, when we're, when we're looking at what's going on here, yeah, it is surprising, and many in uh, the international community have been surprised at um, the, either the broad statements being made rather than specifically addressing uh, the human rights concerns in Rakhine State by Aung San Suu Kyi. But also, I think what we're seeing as well is that um, the, the opposition needs to be more than just one person. We are seeing a personality-driven uh, reform process at the moment, and so we also have to look out for who else is uh, voicing their opinions. And in this regard, we've seen um, the Student Generation 88 leadership come out uh, and speak about this uh, directly. So they're obviously now starting to play um, a greater role and we'll, I imagine we'll be seeing a lot more of them uh, in informal politics sure. there. Mike Harris, I want to get back uh, to the issue of the European Union deciding to lift sanctions against Myanmar. How much of this normalization has to do with the idea of securing as many gas and oil exploration contracts as possible for some of the major European companies? Well, I think the reason that uh, the military and the government of Burma have opened up and have begun engaging is because they realised they were overly reliant on China. And so in their reaching out uh, to the West, the US and the EU, um, you know, th this is the reason, that the, the part of the reason why the transition is happening. And, uh, you know, there are these small steps towards a more democratic Burma. Um, from the EU's uh, position, I think there's various factors at play. I mean, the EU don't want to, um, they don't want to put off the process of transition. Um, very small steps have been made. And I think the EU's calculation was that because of these small steps, there should be some reward for the government of Burma, whether they've made this decision too early. Um, it's certainly possible. Uh, especially with this uh, ongoing ethnic conflict. But, but I think it, also it's, though, it's worth... Doesn't it though diminish the EU's leverage with the government in Myanmar? How do you then put pressure on them if you've given them essentially everything they want? Well, I think, there's, uh, you know, I think this is the problem. I think if you, if you lower the sanctions, you've lost your most effective uh, tool. But we've got to remember, only 18 months ago, uh, and it's still the case today that uh, protesting in the streets of Mandalay or Yangon or, or wherever, or, you know, the people I was speaking to when I was on the ground, protesting comes with significant risks. And there are still large numbers of peace uh, demonstrators who have been uh, arrested, detained under Section 505 of the Penal Code. So, you know, it, it's a very, very difficult situation. Wang Zani, how do you then resolve this conflict, this difficult situation, if, as we've been saying, the EU has already decided it's time to lift uh, all sanctions except for the arms embargo, if the NLD, which is the main opposition party, Aung San Suu Kyi's party, the National League of Democracy, has decided not to take on the government on this issue? How do you resolve this conflict? Well, it's very, very difficult. You know, um, I, I mean, as a Burmese, I like to be... Um, uh, optimistic and um, hopeful about my country's future and uh, particularly uh, resolving conflicts uh, peacefully, ethnic or religious or political. I lived there for 25 years and I knew what it was like uh, to fight against a regime that was backed by the entire financial and military might of the Western uh, powers. And now I think that our country is moving into that phase of uh, the West um, using the, the language of democratic transition in Burma, uh, Suu Kyi sitting in the parliament as a benchmark or successful benchmark, uh, and yet, um, you know, backing the military, whatever it does, giving them an international impunity, even in case where there is a legitimate and solid ground to call Rohingya persecution a genocide. And so, what we are seeing is the repeat of the Cold War, and okay, the, the uh, Burmese people are sandwiched between these giants. Mangzani, difficult, challenging 
Mwang situation, no doubt. Let me thank all of our guests for joining us and sharing their thoughts with us on this. Mwang Zani, Alistair Cook, and Mike Harris. And thank you, as always, for joining us from Miri Dafakhri and the entire team. Thank you for watching.